Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar uh, on career opportunities in geoinformatics. Uh, we are very happy to have Dr. Tariq Rashid, Vice President and Chief Technical Officer of Civil Zoology Limited, a private research and development company headquartered in Wyoming, US. Um, Dr. Rashid is also a former senior research professor and director of geoinformatics at Indiana University in the US, and is currently a visiting professor and consultant in geoinformatics at Amrita Vishwa Vidya Pita. Uh, Dr. Rashid has been a geospatial technology scientist for over 26 years, engaging in multidisciplinary research, combining areas such as architectural engineering, computer science, geographical information systems, and remote sensing. Before we officially start today's webinar, I invite Professor Sethu Rao to give a quick overview about the Amrita Center for Wireless Networks and Applications and talk about the three MTech programs the center currently offers. Professor Sethu. Thank you, Soumya. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar by Dr. Rashid. Uh, so let me give you a brief uh, overview of the center, the research center that is bringing you this webinar. We are known as the Center for Wireless Networks and Applications. And uh, we offer uh, a lot of uh, master's programs and PhD programs. I would like to highlight one program today known as uh, Masters in Geoinformatics and uh, Earth Observation. So today's uh, webinar has a lot of relevance to uh, that particular program called uh, Geoinformatics and uh, Earth Observation. Uh, Dr. Rashid is a uh, faculty um, you know, with uh, a lot of international experience in that program and there are other faculty again with uh, you know, international experience and also uh, renowned faculty from India like uh, Dr. Vadhavan who retired from uh, you know, the Geological Survey of India as a director general. So he's also a faculty and there are many more. There is uh, you know, Dr. Um, um, uh, I don't get his name. Uh, you know, he has experience uh, you know, working in Norway and uh, Germany and South Africa. Uh, uh, Sajid, sorry, Dr. Sajid and so on. You know, uh, I am a faculty as well. I spent quite a bit of time in the, uh, in the United States before I joined Amrita. Uh, so anyway, you know, this program uh, focuses on these, uh, you know, problems and the way the solutions uh, such as the ones that are caused due to, you know, global warming, uh, due to, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the need for green energy. So a lot of uh, problems that have great relevance to today's world, you know. So if you get involved in this program, you can also have the satisfaction of having, having I mean, working on some, some problems that have tremendous relevance to the contemporary world. And of course, Dr. Rashid will tell you about the career opportunities that are going to uh, you know, make themselves uh, available for you when you take up this program. And the other thing I want to mention is we also have an integrated uh, PhD program. We have a Center for Sustainable Development. So you have an opportunity to uh, kind of pursue your, uh, you know, study further and convert that into a PhD uh, degree as well. And with the integrated program, you get to, uh, you know, speed up your whole uh, PhD program as well. So you can continue your research in the same area. You can reduce your coursework. So you could potentially finish your PhD in a, with an addition of about two to two and a half years or maximum three years. So that is the you know advantage. So we have a Center for Sustainable Development. A lot of attractive scholarships available. So, you know, and again, if you go to our website, you'll see that we are working on a lot of interesting projects, uh, you know, in which all the faculty are involved, like, you know, monitoring landslides in different parts of India, um, you know, flood monitoring. Uh, we talk about uh, ocean monitoring, you know, uh, you know, coastal weather monitoring. A lot of interesting projects uh, which are funded, which are also, you know, multinational in the sense, you know, they're all collaborative with uh, either with Europe or some country in Europe, USA and so on. 
again i don't want to take to take up too much time going into all that uh, so essentially when you uh, you know we, in that because of that you get opportunities to opportunity to conduct your uh, collaborative research with the bgs the british geological survey national research council of italy king's college london newcastle university in the uk uk meteorological office politecnico di milano in italy upc in spain tu delft in netherlands university of tel aviv in israel and this is just a, you know a sample list there are, there are many other such uh, institutions and organizations we work with so we, you know you get to work with the international faculty as your co guide and so on so uh, and then you know in terms of projects again water management water distribution a lot of interesting projects that we work on um, we work with a lot of uh, in the industry as well both indian as well as international uh, before i conclude i want to mention a couple of other programs that we also have masters programs and phd programs in these areas one is uh, wireless networks and applications wireless networks and applications and also uh, another program in uh, biomedical instrumentation and signal processing biomedical instrumentation and signal processing so in addition to geoinformatics and earth observation uh, we have two other masters programs wireless networks and applications and biomedical instrumentation and signal processing and by the way there are a lot of attractive scholarships for these masters programs as well and also the last date for application for this masters program is coming up programs is coming up it is the uh, 5th of july so you know it's a, uh, i guess it's tomorrow yeah so you know uh, if you are interested in pursuing your masters or any of your friends or acquaintances are interested please do let them know and uh, this is a great opportunity to do your masters and phd at uh, amrita with that said uh, i wish you all a great uh, day and i will hand it off to Dr. Rashid to present uh, his uh, webinar to all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sess, uh, for uh, the introduction. Thanks so for the introduction as well. And it's my pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I thank Emirates University so much for giving me the opportunity to give you this short talk about career opportunities in geoinformatics. And um, uh, basically, as uh, Thomas introduced me, I have been in the field of geoinformatics for almost 26 or 27 years. And uh, even though I'm based in the US, but I'm also adjunct faculty with Amrita University, and I had the honor to be part of uh, the founding faculty of the new geoinformatics program that started that this year. And um, I was happy to even get a chance to teach one course uh, in the second semester that is ending uh, very soon, despite all of the issues with COVID-19 and the implication of that. So um, the topic of geoinformatics is very dear to my heart because this has been my career since I graduated. So my, my background, it's also nice to prepare this kind of like presentation because it allows, uh, you know, you know, allowed me at least you know to reflect on my career you know as i was preparing this for you guys and uh, i come from uh, engineering background so i graduated as uh, architecture engineer so i was supposed to be working in architecture and construction engineering that was my plan when i was doing my uh, first degree my bachelor degree but uh, it's interesting uh, how sometime um, small i'm not sure it is accident or you know chances or luck whatever you call it or destiny or uh, you know arrangement of god whatever you want to call it that small things that happen can make change the entire path of your life and in my case i happened to be when i was just a fresh graduate and i was planning to be the only thing at the time when i graduated back in the you know early 1990s um, uh, there was not really uh, a lot of um, software tools for architecture engineering except AutoCAD and that was just a tool so basically there was no career in AutoCAD but just you learn a tool so that was the only thing I did in order to improve my opportunity to have a very good like job after I graduate but I happened to be meeting some people at the time from York University in England and uh, the only thing they were doing some archaeological work in Egypt I was in Egypt at the time I'm originally from Egypt and um, they were doing some archaeological work and they were looking for somebody who speaks English who can actually help them in the field work basically like in communicating with the locals because most of the locals there they don't speak English and that was my only qualification at the time and I was a fresh graduate I didn't have I was not really in a hurry to get a job so I said what the heck I can I can help them translate so I went with them as a translator and interesting enough that at the time they were using this kind of like equipment that later on I knew that is called the ground radar 
and that uh, turned my life upside down. So basically, I learned what they were doing, and at the time, I asked it what this kind of like mapping uh, instrument you're using, and they told me it's called remote sensing. And uh, we, they told me how they are using this remote sensing to capture some information under the ground using ground radar, and then turn this into digital map. And then how you use digital map to analyze the archaeological, you know, you know, you know, traces that exist underneath the ground. And that was my beginning in GIS and geoinformatics. And since then, I never left this domain. That became my career, changed my entire life. I ended up doing my master's degree in computer science to learn more about the information system part. And then I did my PhD in geography. And in the middle, I did another master master's degree in disaster management. And since then, I've been in this career. So uh, you never know uh, today as you're listening to me or you have listened already to Dr. Sages before or the other lecture that maybe one lecture this this and you're basically like me, you sit down on the Facebook or whatever you're listening medium, you're listening to me right now and say, oh, I'm going to listen to this guy and see what he's, he's going to say. That could change your career and you change your perspectives. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and uh, show with you basically what will be my presentation today. Uh, and uh, try to make sure I turn off my camera so I don't have exhaust my bandwidth. Can you see my screen? Just can anybody confirm you see my screen? Anybody can see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sir, yes. Can see. perfect, perfect, perfect. So, um, so basically, um, uh, as like my topic is actually, as you see, it is on. Uh, it's basically, you know, just give you some sort of career opportunity in geoinformatics. And the first thing I'd like to, this is like the agenda for today. I'll be covering a little bit, you know, since you are considering, you know, potentially you're watching this because you are thinking about maybe you can join the master program in geoinformatics at Amrita University or trying to explore what I'm going to study. So I think the first thing I, I wanted to talk to you about it is, you know, when you make career decision, what kind of factors? And it is not like, you know, based on scientific stuff. It is basically my own experience. So I've been like I graduated back in 1993, it's 2020. So I have been in, you know, having a career for almost 20, now 27 years. So uh, I'm going to tell you what I have learned from this 27 years and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit why geoinformatics is really a high impact career. And a high impact, it seemed that, you know, you know, what is the definition of high impact? What does it mean to have what we call it high impact career? So I'm going to talk about it because it is really very, very uh, growing uh, industry. And uh, many people at the time when I learned GIS back 27 years ago, I thought at the time I was learning a tool like, you know, I was learning some people learn Excel sheets, some people learn PowerPoint, some people learn AutoCAD. So I was learning a tool for mapping, but it ended up to be a career. And it is not like you, know, you never see somebody whose career is like, you know, has a degree in Excel sheet. You never hear about somebody who has a degree in AutoCAD, but you hear a lot of people who have degree in GIS. So it goes beyond just a software tool. It is really a science. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit and then talk more about what do people do in geoinformatics. Like if you end up taking geoinformatics, what kind of career opportunity you may get, what kind of job you can get. And then give you some sort of like my kind of like wrap up key home, go home messages uh, to uh, to remember. And then of course we'll have a discussion. So hopefully I'll do this within the next 20, 25 minutes and then we'll have a, an open discussion for the rest of the time. So. Um, so again, without going into philosophical, but you know, sometimes you basically end up as you prepare something like this, you think of reflect your career, like what are the value has been actually like making me continue with your informatics all these days. And you know, these are kind of like floating. So which means that now I'm putting this in terms of my current priority of life, but maybe in, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, my priority were different. But the first thing actually, uh, you know, it is one of the few. I think every career in the world, there is a reason it exists. But there are some careers that can actually make you can have a sort of legacy or a sort of impact potential. You can really do something that can actually really touches people, you know, lives immediately and you can make change. And just think about what your informatics can do as I'm going to talk about it. It has so many, uh, you know, it opens for a person if a person is interested really to make impact and make career, you know, make really change to the real world, leave a legacy. Geoinformatics is one of these careers that allow you to do that. And think about what is going right now with COVID-19, you know, and I'm not sure if you guys follow, but just search GIS and COVID-19 and see how many application has been developed already and many tools to allow you to track 
uh, how COVID-19 is spreading and how to compact COVID-19. So yes, medical defense is the first line of defense, the medical staff, but also there is a lot of work happening for the GIS industry to support the effort of the combating uh, COVID-19. So one of the opportunity, like when you think about what's career, you think you'd like to have one career that actually can allow you to have some sort of impact potential. Uh, another thing is personal fit and personal fit here is how you really what is your talents what you like to do and then how you can fit with that and that was something another important thing for me um, uh, when I uh, you know, I have been in GIS for, as I said, 27 years. I worked in different disciplines. I was for some while working within private companies as just GIS specialist, professional. And then when I did my higher degrees and I got my PhD, I started working in academia as academic. And then at one point I decided to be a consultant. So I started consulting for UN organization, UNDP, FAO. I'm doing this right now. Uh, and in the middle, I started, you know, I decided to open my company. So I opened a company and I did some sort of projects for uh, 20, for uh, you know, like 20 plus different projects. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, you know, if you feel like you have different talents and you have different kind of thing, you like, for example, programming, but in the same time, you like managing project and you like teaching. This is one of the, you know, careers that allow you to actually to, you know, satisfy different kind of like talents you 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 will have. And then there is also personal satisfaction. And personal satisfaction is a, a very good, important in a career when you work with God. Unless basically at the end of the day, you feel that you are happy with what you are doing and you are really enjoying it. And you see always there is something that you are learning new. You know, otherwise the job would be boring. It would be like, you know, a very boring job. It's almost like, you know, you won't be able to wake up in the morning to go to your work or do whatever job. So, you know, when you think about your careers in the choice, ask yourself, is this something that actually my talents allow to do? And then would is this something I'll be enjoying doing it? And again, because you informatics uh, is very, very diverse discipline. It's very, there has so many ways to do, uh, to offer you to do your job. So uh, it gives you this personal satisfaction that you never get bored because if even, for example, like, you know, get bored from, say, programming, there is another way to do or you can actually develop, you know, doing consulting, you are tired from consulting, you can do some sort of training. So there is a lot of opportunity there. Um, money, that was one of the things that was actually very early in my career was my choice. Uh, I think it's becoming lower in my priority right now because a little bit I'm getting older and I think I have been working enough to have some sort of capital. So it is not a priority for me anymore. But for one time, it was a very important decision. And um, GIS is one of the higher paid career, even with the IT industry. Uh, I'm not talking, I'm not sure what is about India, but I'm talking 100% sure about the US. So in the US, the medium uh, salary for any programmer in IT, we're talking about 50 to $52,000. For GIS, it's $75,000. This is a median salary. So it is almost like, you know, 50% extra than the typical programmer or anybody else in the IT industry. So it is very good paid. And then, as I said, it has this what we call it option values. The option values is, for example, what's happening to me. I was an academic. I was academic professor for academia for 10 plus years. And then I decided, well, um, you know, as much as I enjoy academia, I'd like also to go and do consulting and I'd like to start my own company. So it always gives you this kind of career flexibility. Think compare this, for example, with somebody who is teaching history, for example, with all respect to history. But, you know, some 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 jobs lend itself to kind of like one kind of domain that you are stuck to this domain all your life because there is no many other option that you can work with. But geoinformatics is one of these areas that allow you to have these options that basically you can always see, you know, you can expand your career ladder if you would like to have. So this is our some of ideas just basically I think it has been helping me to shape my uh, decisions in uh, geoinformatics and I wanted to share with you that because I think as you are considering uh, whether or not you'd like to join the geoinformatics master program you may actually think about it uh, you know in terms of wh whatever you value more it is like you know you are you interested in something that give you a sort of like so many opportunities in the future so you always have a sort of rich career path are you interested in money? Are you interested in something that satisfies your talent? You have give, so, and interesting enough with the geoinformatics, it satisfies all these needs. So basically, it is really a very, very nice, you know, career to pursue if you have multiple ambitious goals and your priority will change over time. So with that, I'm going to actually move forward a little bit with giving you some sort of info, uh, uh, some sort of. Uh, 
uh, background about uh, why geoinformatics is really considered uh, what we call it high impact uh, career. Um, uh, back in, in the US, there is something called uh, National Academy of Science. And the National Academy of Science is uh, considered a kind of like uh, a consulting agency for uh, uh, for the US government. So basically it's called actually the National Academy of Engineering, Science and Medicine. And every once in a while they publish, uh, they bring some experts and those experts sit down together. And what they do is they just try to write advice for the US government about certain kind of things. Could be about the economy, could be about education, could be about like, you know, job marketing and so on. So back in 2005, uh, the National Academy of Science, they uh, published this book called Learning to Think Specially. So and specially is basically a way like basically just uh, promoting this concept of special thinking, how we think through maps. And uh, one of the big things that always caught me is this, and I have been quoting this a lot, that in 2005, that was the beginning of the 21st century, and those people came together and said basically, what is kind of like, uh, you know, industry that is supposed to be critical for the growth of the US government in the 21st century. And they identified at the time three kind of like industries. Geospatial engineering, or geospatial technology, bio biomedical technology, or biotechnology in general, and then nanotechnology. So, um, uh, so for that, basically, that was back in the 20, uh, in 2005. At that time, we were talking about like, you know, GIS, this is 2004, 2002. So basically, geospatial industry at the time. And when we talk about geoinformatics or geospatial industry, we're talking kind of like a very interesting broad range of techniques. One of them is remote sensing, the satellite imagery that are up in the space, taking imagery from different kind of the Earth and capture this information and uh, analyzing this. So we can know, for example, there is something called ozone hole. There is something called climate change. So this kind of stuff are happening through satellite imagery. There's also GPS and we go as we all new GPS because you are using every day uh, to go from one place to another. So how we capture information with GPS, what other factors that actually um, you know, influence or impact the accuracy of the GPS signals. And then there is the mapping part, the mapping, how we bring this into a digital map, like Google Map, for example, you know, or other maps and uh, analyze this information and do different applications. So these are kind of like family of discipline that together we call this your special technology. So at this time, back in 2004, we were talking about uh, an industry which was around $2.5 million. So a you know, billion dollar with billion. So, um, so it was growing a little bit, you know, slowly, and then all of a sudden, basically, by 2011, that has jumped it to over 200 billion dollar industry, and uh, over the past maybe last decade, the curve has been almost vertical. So, as we are approaching 2020, we are talking about an industry that is worth for over 450 billion dollar. And the reason, of course, because now we have smartphones, all of us are using actually Google Maps to go from one place to another without even knowing that what we are really using are your special technology. Uh, we see basically like, you know, we, you know, everybody is, uh, you know, relying on sort of kind of informational, like locational information somehow. And without really knowing that underneath this is there is a lot of tools and application and technology and things like boosting this one. So when an industry is growing that fast, and that vertical are multiplying always like from what? From $2.5 billion in 15 years to almost over $400 billion. We'll talk about, I don't know, do the math. It was like, I think 5,000 times more than it was before. Then, you know, that in, automatically translates to a lot of job opportunity, a lot of good paid, a lot of diversity of application, and people realizing that it was useful. So basically, basically back in 2005, when those people at the National Science Academy in the US, the predicted geospatial technology is very critical. It's almost like uh, uh, how the electricity was important for the change of human life back in the early 20th century or before that, how the coal was good for the industrial revolution. That's really true. And um, just to give you an example for that, 
uh, here is just a gallery of different applications that all of them are using geospatial technologies. Smart cities, if you hear about smart cities, is a big thing right now, and we're talking about smart infrastructure, smart medicine, smart transportation, smart environment, and all of these are based on what we call it geospatial data infrastructure. So because it is a city, one place to another, so all these you know smart application cannot really implement it unless you have a very very solid geographic database and tools that allow you to deal with geographic database in a big data sense. So smart city is one of the application, of course, you know, space technology. So India is trying to land its first uh, rocket on the moon. Uh, the attempt was failed in last last year, but hopefully that will happen again this year. So how they are using this, there is a lot of technology there. All of these are related you know, directly to your special technology. Wildlife uh, conservation, taking care of the animals, how we track the animals movement in the forest, how we understand their behavior, how we allow us to uh, create, for example, a sort of like uh, virtual fence around them so nobody can actually intrude them, how we even monitor preservation, that's all GIS or geoinformatics. Uh, logistics tracking, like, you know, trucks, shipment, aviation of the airplane, all these your special man. Even if you order your pizza tomorrow, uh, I'm not sure if they allow delivery right now in India because of the COVID-19, but if they do, then this is again based on, you know, some sort of digital map, mobile application, accessibility, ZGIS, of course, real estate, landscape, uh, cadastral planning, management of the city. This is based on GIS. Emergency response. This is GIS. Utility planning, just to lay down where exactly the utility line, electricity, gas, uh, water. This is geographic information system. Sustainable agriculture, like I'm working right now at this moment in a big project in Guyana, and it is a big project that is actually uh, is around 40 plus million dollars that is sponsored by EU and the whole idea there is try to bring together what they call a sustainable forest and agriculture database. So building a GIS database like you know unified data to allow a lot of smart applications in support of sustainable agriculture and sustainable and smart agriculture as well. So this is again important. COVID-19, this is this is very timely one. Even all this, you, you, maybe you hear how in South Korea, and uh, in Singapore, I'm not sure if this is happening in India, but they have developed this application. They call it track, trace and track. So if somebody is infected, you can track how this person walks, you know, and interact with other people. So you can track the possibility of this person transmitting, you know, the COVID-19 virus to other people, and you can compact this other people before it's transmitted. Of course, there is a big question here about privacy, but the bottom line here, it is a GIS application. Uh, school planning, uh, of course, you know, GIS was developed in the first place to support a lot of military applications. So all the military things that's happening, you know, all GPS, what you hear about is called like you know, the drone uh, uh, airplanes. And of course, what they call a smart bombing. All this is happening through geospatial technology. Um, a big thing right now happening in, uh, for example, the call building information uh, modeling. So, for example, if you have ever tried online something called virtual uh, tourism, like virtual tour in a in a museum or a virtual tour in a site, that's also enabled to you through virtual uh, reality technology integrated with your informatic technology. Uh, the Olympics uh, of London, you know, and probably the Olympics of Tokyo, if it was not cancelled, that is all planned on the entire. So event planning is a big thing in geoinformatics because you would like to have a situation analysis. If you'd like to plan where the people will come to enter the event, to go out from the event, how to manage the security of the event and prevent any accident. This is all geoinformatics, uh, different kind of like energy mapping and archaeological engineering. So you see basically or talk about almost anything at one point or another that needs sort of like geospatial information, need to use a map and a map, even in a paper format or a digital format, that could be a domain for geoinformatics. And because all this, like whatever you're seeing the screen, and these are just sample of application area that require mapping and require digital information, a mapping and a digital information, then automatically this becomes a domain of geoinformatics. So you can see basically like why the reason, you know, because GIS has been expanding in all this kind of domain, this is why it is becoming like, you know, uh, 450 billion plus industry, while 15 years ago it was a very small industry because there were no, basically the people were not realizing how important it is for their day-to-day -day life and interaction. 
And you may realize now, probably I have been using GIS for a while without even knowing about GIS. You know, I've been using Google Map without knowing what is going underneath, like what it takes to prepare these maps in a way to allow me to find that my place from one place to another. So now you, you realize that basically you have been a GIS user for a long time without even knowing that. So, uh, so one big question here, you can see in the industry here. So there is no actually uh, doubt like, you know, if you just basically, I, I, I did this in the morning today. Like it was all this like very, very fresh news. Like you see Apple, for example, Apple, just look at the, I'm not sure if you can see how good you can see this, but Apple, for example, they have in their website, for advertising, all of them has to do with mapping and geospatial informatics, starting from $53,000 to $100,000K to senior data application engineers that actually pay up to almost $300,000 a year. So this is just an example of application like Apple. You go to Google, they have like this. Almost every single industry here, we're not talking about you know, government or we talk about university. Of course, if you go to university GIS jobs, this is one of the very high demand jobs, like you know, maybe even for a while in the US, uh, they have been like, you know, a few university are not offering what they call a tenure track position, but still when it comes to GIS, it is automatically tenure track because the demand is so much on GIS professor that actually to attract them to their universities, they offer tenure track, while in other industries, they don't offer them tenure track. They just offer like a you know, one year contract and it is renewable. So this is just an example of how industry, university are just being in the GIS domain open for you, lots of opportunities that otherwise is not open. Here is another one just for consulting. And just even in India here, I was just looking at India and you see basically even in the COVID-19, where the economy is very bad, and people are laid off and worried about basically finding a job. See how many jobs are coming in the economy. This is from June 3 to June 12. All these are India. Basically, remote sensing GIS guidance, peer reviewed, whatever paper preparation, LIDAR data, whatever. Different tops. I didn't know how much they are paying here, but I was just I was basically looking even in India itself. You know, like, you know, it is it is growing and the demand here, even when we talk about, you know, potential uh, going through a very kind of like economic crisis and economic recession, GIS is becoming an exception. It's growing. People are demanding, you know, jobs on that. So this is a good example of how this industry is growing. Just to give you an example here in the US itself, there's around 500 million uh, person who is working in a way or another using geospatial information. So not geospatial professional, but they are at least relying on in jobs or application developed by GIS people. And as I told you, the average job for uh, salary is around $74,000, while basically in anybody in the IT industry is in the range of 50, 50 plus thousand dollars. This is the median, of course, for example. So the median mean could be in the middle here. So it could be actually this and low, but this is the general kind of like, you know, salary pay. One thing that is different, like as I told you, when I learned about GIS back in 1994, 1993, 1994, at the time I thought I was learning a tool, but uh, uh, you know, uh, one sign that, you know, GIS has been kind of like progressing as a profession, as a career that you can actually like, you know, one thing I, for years, if somebody told me, what do you do in for work? I keep telling I'm a GIS professor. Then they said, what? And then I have to explain to them what is GIS and I have to explain them with digital mapping. But now the world has been actually been kind of like very broad that, you know, a lot of people, whenever they say a GIS, they really understand that. So basically it's almost like becoming a career. Another good thing is um, sign is the concept of certification. So in the old time, anybody who has taken a course in GIS could claim to be a GIS specialist. But now it is becoming a title. For example, my name is Tarek Rashid and because I have a PhD, I signed Tarek Rashid and then I put PhD, like this is my title. So now it is becoming very common that you know a lot of people they get GIS professional certificate and exactly like you know doctor sign MD uh, people who have some sort of like you know uh, accounting CPA and then you know PhDs and then you have something called GISP and GISP means GIS professional like almost like project management professional PMP and um, there is a certificate here and this certification institutes have around 675 almost near a million person certified and um, even they are talking about and there is an exam you have to go through this process to, in order to get certification and a lot of employee asks people to have to be certified professional in order to practice this. So it's becoming in the US almost like nursing like uh, um, uh, practicing law for law, you have to pass a certain kind of bar to in order to be able to practice, uh, you know, um, as a lawyer. 
the same you have to do for medical science, for nursing. The same is becoming slowly, like it's not 100% like that, but in GIS, slowly, a lot of uh, states require now to be GISP in order to do this, other or equivalent. So equivalent, for example, if you have a master's degree from Amrita University, that would equate a GIS professional certificate or even exceed that. So just that is an example that we know, whenever you see a domain that's becoming to put some sort of regulation, you understand that how this domain is becoming important and is becoming significant that people have to get sure that you get certified in order to practice this. Another good sign, about that is the growing body of uh, professional organizations. So uh, in my time, there was no professional organization for GIS, but over the past 15 years, like I'm talking only in the US and international, there have been so many, this is as a sample, there is something called like American Congress uh, on Surveying and Mapping. Yes, it is surveying and mapping, but now it has GIS part. American Society for Photogrammetric Engineering and Remote Sensing, Association of American Geographers, all these are actually almost like professional associations to bring together those people with GIS background to extend information. There is URESA. URESA is a very big uh, known organization in North America and Canada, US, and some, I think, European country. GAYATA is international organization all over the world and also promoting GIS technology. And then you have the University Consortium of Geographic Information Science. So all these are professional bodies that, you know, try to bring together you know, GIS professional as an association. And again, this is a very good sign that basically like, you know, whenever you see diversity of professional bodies in in Europe, in North America and in Asia and all over the world, and you look at a paper, you know, journal and activity conferences, this actually is a very healthy sign of how this domain is growing in a healthy, steady way. Last, um, you know, even now we have something called GIS Day. So every year, uh, during uh, the third uh, Thursday of, or the second or third Thursday of every year is dedicated to BGIS Day. So, you know, in GIS Day, that is opportunity for people to come together and celebrate GIS and spread the knowledge to even the kids. So we are talking now about geoinformatics for K-12, how we can actually spread geoinformatic knowledge and how to use geo basically skills, like when you teach math skills, for kids in, in, in uh, elementary school and you know and you teach them some sort of skills they also you know there is this idea that they also need to learn about mapping skills in this LDA so as they grow up they can actually understand the you know importance of geoinformatics and importance of spatial thinking so I found this interesting video and I hope it plays which actually describe what okay this is a war this is how it's happening in us mainly because this is where i am interacting most of the time but also what's happening in india so i found this interesting video that i wanted to share with you so let me play this but just uh, can balo can you confirm if you can hear it okay i'm gonna play it now can you play it can you hear it now it's loading sir. loading sir. Yeah, it is loading, so. OK, let me show that it is not correctly because. Uh, for some reason it is, it can be, it was loading perfectly before, so let me. Uh, exit this. Just a second. It, OK, I'll try to make it again, so this is a kind of uh, interesting. Uh, OK. OK. It's not playing, huh? Uh, no, uh, sir. No, sir. OK, I have a turn the video. Let me. I wanted to present it from here, but let me try to get it from another. I have it also. I always take my precaution just in case, so let me. India, a land Can you hear this? Yes, we can hear. Yes, we can hear. Okay, well, hold the hold the second until me. Just I make the the voice loud enough. You guys can hear. Okay. All right. Just you can get it get it as as loud as possible for you guys. Are you sharing your screen as well? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I, I I was just making sure I'm loading this, so not this. Just hold me a second here. I'm, I'm loading everything except, yeah, here it is. 
OK, so we start back here, so. India, a land of diversity can and hear me well? is standing at the helm of a new dawn. I can hear As but not see. Yes, the 3 billion population. Ah. India is embracing new technologies and... OK, so let me see how I can do the screen again. I will try to unshare and share. OK. Can you see now? Yes. OK, so now you see and then you will have to hear. OK, one, two, three. India, a land of diversity yes. and opportunities, is standing at the helm of a new dawn. As a nation of 1.33 billion population, India is embracing new technologies and solutions to ride the wave of change. A critical element that will leverage this momentum is the use and adoption of geospatial and space technologies. Today, India is the second most preferred market for the global geospatial industry. India's geospatial economy is estimated to be valued at $3 billion, with over a $1 billion coming from export of geospatial services. The geospatial industry employs more than 250,000 professionals. However, due to the restrictive and complex policy environment, India's geospatial market is highly underrealized. While the Indian geospatial market is growing at about 15% per annum, it has the potential to grow at 25% annually, making it worth $7 billion, employing nearly a million people by 2025. A national geospatial and earth observation industrial policy for India can empower the entire ecosystem, laying the foundation for self-reliant India in the digital so uh, what I wanted to share with you here, and I'll go back to share uh, something here, and then I'll continue my presentation. Uh, uh, there is actually an interesting uh, website that maybe I'll share with you. It's called about the India Geospatial Technology Forum, and uh, they are trying to promote uh, the use of geospatial te technology in India. And uh, going back to share screen. And uh, basically, as you heard from this, uh, basically from uh, what uh, the presentation was saying, um, think about it. In the US, 300 million people, or talk about 5 million people using GIS in a way or another. Technology was around near, you know, 1 million, like 700,000 people certified. In India, 1.3 billion and only 250 million professional. Um, but it's becoming number two in the in the market, according to what you are saying here. And I saw the market study. Uh, it is really it looks like robust and it's growing because there is a lot of investment uh, happening and services provided. So it is a really exciting time to be part of the geoinformatics. And it, actually, I think this is one of the reason why Ge Amrita University decided to start a master program in geoinformatics because the prospects are, this is a, a golden time to become, to join the part. Maybe in the future will be a lot of people, but right now, if you end up being part of the geoinformatics, this is a good opportunity to progress in a very brilliant career that actually had lots of opportunity because you can see it is actually expected to be growing 25% a year and from 25, 250 professional right now working in different domains to a million uh, in the next, uh, until 2025, next five years. So it's really, you know, growing very well in India. So this kind of like quick overview of you know, the impact. This is why we call why geoinformatics is really a high impact career because there is a lot of disciplines that benefiting from geoinformatics. It is a diversity of application and areas you can work with is enormous from basically enormous from uh, from smart cities to conservation to urban city planning to utility planning to anything you can think of that you can use the map. So one big thing here is what basically what people do in geoinformatics. So what basically what kind of jobs people do in geoinformatics. And uh, with that, uh, before I start, uh, there's something called basically, and this was developed, initial version was developed back in 2006, but was reviewed 2015. There is this called geospatial informatics body of knowledge. 
what does mean body of knowledge? Like, you know, there is so many levels to learn about geoinformatics. There is no something like there is no one thing like, you know, not every geo, geo every person in the geospatial technology or geoinformatics do the same like other other people. There is different places. There is some people who focus on building platforms, people building on programming, other work on data captures, other people in database management, other people actually are GIS analysts. They actually analyze data. You don't play, build the platform or applications. Uh, there are so there's different kind of like level to become a GIS. So again, as I told you earlier when I was talking about a, a multi-value domain, this is one of the about the multi-value because once you learn about it, there is different passes, you know, you can do through it. And I was fortunate enough because I have been there for a while to try different kind of experiments. So I, 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 I right now I'm building platform in Guyana and also I'm teaching a course in um, with India. Before that, I was working in a project related to geospatial uh, disaster modeling in uh, the Iceland of uh, um, uh, Barbados in the Caribbean, so that was analysis. So it gives you all this one, and the reason because there is so many kind of like you know areas, and the more you learn about it, so I call this the GIS practice area. So there is a lot of practice area and different type of knowledge. So the first two ones are those people maybe who are like you right now who have been using Google, Google Maps or using some sort of mapping, digital mapping to go from one place to another, and they are using this any on a daily basis without even knowing they are using geospatial technology, but from the level of analyst, as we go up, this is the domain when you start studying it. You know, this is why basically I think geoinformatics brings you automatically, if you take this master degree, into this level of becoming analyst or specialist. And which mean on the side here, on the right side here, it means expanding actually your level of knowledge from just knowing there's something called digital map and allow you to go from one place to another. There's something called GPS to more understand how you can use this, how it's created, what is the underlying principle that allow you to create this and how you can use this technology in order to solve some sort of problem um, uh, related to certain kind of domain, for example, landslide modeling or certain kind of, you know, findings in a hospital to accommodate the COVID-19 patients or, you know, how we land uh, the next rocket uh, that is coming from the Indian Space Agency on certain kind of like a place, place on the other side of the moon. So as the more uh, you go and then the ultimate one, you become a scientist that you are, your knowledge has been expanding so much that encompasses a lot of uh, a lot of this topics related to the body of knowledge that you, the more you understand that, the more you learn about it, the more becomes your, you know, you're able not only that you are user, but you are able to innovate. And then, of course, there is some sort of occupational one. So in the US, there is something called your special competency model. And what it does here, it just show you basically like how different competencies related to different kinds. And usually there is like three different careers or area related to geospatial technology. One is focus on how we acquire the data, how this data are generated, how satellite and for example, remote sensing. It's an entire career about how you can actually capture the data in a correct way, how you can launch satellite imagery to go to the orbit, and then how you design a sensor and this sensor can capture information and then how to analyze this information. So the data acquisition like surveying GPS using remote sensing is a field within geospatial technology, focusing how we capture the data in a digital format about certain kind of phenomena, about climate change, about, for example, land use, land cover change, about, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, temperature and so on. Another one has to do with the analysis and mapping. So, OK, once we capture this data, how we can analyze data? This data are just data, how we can, can transform this into knowledge and information. So this is also one of the specialization within geoinformatics. So either you capture the data and then analyze the data. And then the third one is more kind of like how we develop software tool, how we develop an a, a application app, like mobile app or certain kind of platform. So this is like the three like well broad categories of specialization in geoinformatics. And also there is something, you know, more kind of like in the managerial. So there is a kind of like career ladder from going from just being analyst to specialist and then how you can manage projects and then how you can become a director and so on. So this is kind of like also occupation and careers that allow you to, to explore like, you know, there's a sort of pyramid and competency. And when you get certified, you're certified in one of this area or more. And then as you develop more, you become actually more kind. So it's actually one of this interesting area because it has very, very nice clear career path that actually you can spend your entire life progressing in this career. So with that, I'd like to show you three videos 
And these three videos covering different kind of career example to show you how GIS. One has to do with uh, a scientist working in climate change and using GIS in order to analyze climate change. The other one is more kind of like a geek computer uh, application developer using G building apps for GIS. And then the third one is a manager who is managing project related to GIS, just to show you a glimpse of different kind of application. So I'm going to actually just show you video one by one right now to enjoy it, and then we will conclude. Um, I'm good in time, Balo, right? Yeah, Balo Makon, right? Time is good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So just make sure because I tend to speak too much sometimes. Okay, so I'm going to just give me one by one just to share the screen here. So the first one I said the geospatial scientist. So, okay, what? Wait, wait, wait. Okay, now I share the screen again. Okay. So uh, these are not my videos. I have stolen this video from a company called Esri, so I give credit to Esri. It's so important that everybody understand global change issues. We are literally talking about the future of our species and our planet, Spaceship Earth, which is the only place that life exists in the universe that we know of. So yes, it's important to share information about our planet with everybody. My name is Ned Gardner. I work for the Climate Program Office, which is based in Silver Spring, Maryland. I work day to day at the National Climatic Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina, which is the world's largest climate archive. And so I'm based here because most of my work deals with visualizing data, taking climate information and making it into a product that someone can understand. Through making maps and making movies and visualizations, it's helping people see the relevance to their own life, to be climate smart. Being climate smart means taking the information we have and adapt. Farmers need to know, is it going to be a dry summer and spring? Is it going to be a wet summer or spring? Or the way tropical cyclones form, look, there's a pattern to it. What I'm looking for, or with the story that I tell, I want them to see a house was torn down by this destructive event. I want you to see yourself there if you were facing that disaster and begin to see the bigger picture of why it's important. Sandy made landfall near Atlantic City, New Jersey on October 29th and set the all-time lowest barometric pressure reading for the Northeast. Sandy's large size and track brought record storm surge to many locations. A lot of climate science is really based on a thermometer in the water in the ocean floating or probes going up into the atmosphere are still incredibly important for our understanding of how the atmosphere works. You combine that with the synoptic big picture perspective of satellites and we can start to piece together not only how individual particles change and individual places change, but how the whole Earth system works. Temperature in the Arctic has risen twice as fast as the global average. That means as an ecologist, get exposed to a lot of information about how we as humans are altering Earth now, 7 billion people on the planet, that we begin to understand the processes on our planet better and use that information to manage what we do. And so the mapping is something that I think people really understand. We are designing really crisp products so that people can understand the climate system. But when we want to design a map using all the care of a cartographer, we can use an Esri product. But these maps and this information is what gives us the feedback. It's like our dashboard. If you're going down the highway, you need to know how fast you're going so that you can be safe. And the maps tell us whether we're in the safe operating space for humanity, for all of life. I take that very seriously. Like that's what gets me up in the morning to do this job for NOAA. And what's really been fun is being at the intersection of that art and the science that, need, that we need to communicate. I also love learning from climate scientists because they're so passionately dedicated to understanding the physics of one behavior in the climate system. I just love reaching someone who didn't realize that they care about the climate. It's important for kindergartners to be excited about the planet. It's important for senators to be excited about this planet. Protected. Why wouldn't decision makers want to protect this beautiful place where we live? 
So this is an example. As I told you, there is different kind of like potential areas, like there is uh, data acquisition and analysis and modeling. And this was example of analysis and modeling and then the software development. So uh, I'll show you another example right now uh, related to um, uh, building applications in uh, GIS. So I will also try again to to share with you another uh, video. Uh, I have lots of videos here actually, but I just I'll try to get you the application the one that I saw that might be interested for you guys. So right again, this is another application of developing tools. I didn't even know what computer science was when I went to college and didn't find out about the field until after I graduated. But then when I saw all the really interesting tools that people were building, I thought, I want to build those tools and those applications. My name is Christine Mobius, and I'm an application developer at Blue Raster, which is a mapping services company based in Arlington, Virginia. We provide users a visual representation of global important data. And so rather than looking at data in a series of tables or just simple bar graphs, when you connect that data to geographic locations, it really tells a much richer story of the information behind that data. I went back to a program. They have something called a web development immersive, which is a three month 40 plus hour a week, very intensive program that focuses on the hands-on fundamentals of coding. And here I am doing the things that I love every day. I take geospatial data that's prepared by analysts and incorporate it with code to make interactive web maps. Here in the office, we use a suite of products provided by Esri and ArcGIS. The most common one that we use is the Esri ArcGIS JavaScript API, which allows us to create these visual interactive web maps that the user can see on the internet. You can get started by entering a major that you might be interested in studying in college. Let's type in computer science and then we can see all the schools in the United States that have courses in computer science. One of my most recent projects has been with the National Center for Education Statistics. This is where the magic happens in the code. If we want to change the base map, currently the base map is a light gray color, but let's say we want to change the base map to use satellite imagery. We can simply replace the term gray vector with satellite, and then when it refreshes, you'll see now that we have a different base map in our application. I was also responsible for making this application mobile friendly. So if a user were to visit this website on a cell phone or a tablet, they'd be able to use the application very easily. The greatest satisfaction I get out of my job is when I finally solve a really hard problem. And I finally have an aha moment where something clicks and I figure out in the code and the application works as expected. And so those aha moments are really, really rewarding. Oh, I didn't even lose my Loda. I don't even lose my Loda. So if you'd like to become an application developer, the most common path is to go to a university and receive a degree in computer science or information systems. My advice for anybody who is interested in getting into coding is to just keep building things and learn through failure. It's very important to read up on the theories behind computer science, but until you actually build a program, you're not going to get that hands-on experience. There are a number of soft skills that are also required to do the job successfully. One needs to know how to collaborate very well. A lot of times I get stuck on a problem and when I do, I can reach out to my coworkers and we can problem solve together until we figure out the solution. One way to increase or improve your collaboration skills is to code together. And when you do that, you learn how to problem solve with your peers, and then that is a skill that you can easily take into the workplace. When you have fun with your coworkers, that's when the best work is done. You can make the next multi-billion dollar business. I get challenged every day. I get to be creative every day. I'd say this is the best job I've ever had. So this is an example, again, working in somebody and actually, as I said before, geoinformatics is very, very multidisciplinary in a way that those people who are having master degree could be from 
geography department, could be from engineering, from surveying, from electric engineering, could be from computer science, could be from biology, from geology. And just interesting because all of these share the concept of how to use a map. To do something and then basically there is different kind of like a specialization within that but you still have to understand the basic concept of mapping and how to deal with the technology and how to do analysis and modeling uses the technology and this is the beauty of studying geoinformatics so let me show you the last application the last video here before i finish and that is also related for uh, how to manage GIS project because one of the big thing in GIS is when you have a project and you need to manage this and if you even graduate probably your ultimate goal at one point when you work in, in you know in a team or whatever to become a manager or a director so this is uh, an experience from somebody who worked as a GIS uh, manager so let me share this with you My name is Ingrid Bruce and I'm the GIS manager at the city of Rancho Cucamonga, California. GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. It is a combination of maps and technology. Could you bring up for me the assessed valuations for 88.2 CFP? GIS is extremely powerful because 80% of everything that we do is based on location and GIS allows us to look at everyone, anything spatially, where you are in time, where you are at that particular point. We can use GIS to, to pinpoint anything in the world. We at the city like to think that we're on the cutting edge here with it. Two weeks ago, we had the Grand Prix fires here in the city of Rancho Cucamonga. Earlier in the summer, we had mapped over 400 miles of access roads to allow the, the fire department in case of an emergency to be able to know how to access the foothills. This was invaluable to them during the fire. It was of tremendous use in minimizing the loss here at the city during these fires. Okay, the green identifies where we have some open space. I'm gonna... The power of GIS is the information behind the map and we can zoom in on a specific parcel a, a plot of land we can identify ownership we can identify the size of the parcel we can identify the type of, of soil that it is we can also tell if that particular piece of, of property to a developer or an investor is a good location for building um, a restaurant gis is an exciting technology. However, GIS will not work without the people behind it. My staff, I feel, are the best GIS technicians in the entire world. They see this technology and they have a vision for it. They can see the things that we can do. They can be very creative. Okay, well, you know, we're always here to help you with that. So GIS helps the city in numerous ways. We sit with with the departments and we talk to them about the project. It is entirely up to us to show them how how great this technology is. And what makes the job more interesting is, is when we go to give them a finished product and they're looking at us and going, wow, I didn't know you could do that. I think that's the, the most exciting part for all of us is to be able to wow them with this technology. I love my job. I absolutely love my job. I love my staff. I think they're a wonderful set, brilliant set of um, individuals that make my life easier because without them, I couldn't do it. Students that are interested in GIS as a, as a career path should love technology, should have um, a creative mind, love the outdoors, the world around them, want to know more about the world around them. They should have inquisitive minds with the software and, you know, it's there, but it's up to you as to how far you can expand it, where it can go with it. There are absolutely no limits to what can be done using GIS. So, uh, so this is just a different example here. And I guess as you see in the example here, like, you know, I intentionally try to make to make to uh, 
where is my uh, just give me a second here yeah i was intentionally trying to make uh, sure that i have a sort of like nice collection of different ones so you saw from somebody's trying to understand the global climate change and how it's happening that are like the first one to somebody who's running day-to-day -day city activity police dispatching you know city planning trying to do some sort of modeling to somebody who's developing an application so with that let me show off some of the work i have done myself and um, what I'm going to do show you basically like, you know, last year I met those people. Uh, it is actually it was uh, a humanitarian foundation based in the US and those people were um, trying to raise money for uh, uh, a problem with the country of Venezuela. If you guys have heard about what's going on in Venezuela, I'm not sure yes or no, but it is uh, it is uh, one of these places that is actually uh, uh, impacted like you know it has been the country has problem for now for three four years and there is a lot of Venezuelan uh, people you know escaping the country trying to basically to neighbor countries like Peru uh, Brazil because of the situation like that but when those people the resources foundation presented their work it was just very boring PowerPoint presentation statistics stuff like that's not engage people so I offer them voluntarily that I can volunteer for them and give them some sort of like we can tell the story of the crisis, but instead of getting the Satori in terms of like boring maps, a boring uh, PowerPoint presentation, we can make interactive map where people can interact and do that. So I did this story that you guys see in the screen here, going to what is happening and you know, around $4.5 million allow people to click and get information about what's going on to compare like putting charts for what's happening compare for example refugees between different you know crises, Syria, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, that and then putting video to show on the map basically uh, the story of like some example of what's happening with uh, Venezuela and how they are escaping from one place to another moving more why they are doing this so basically having an interactive map like you guys see in the screen here okay where they go here in Colombia they go in Colombia in this place and or Peru or Ecuador and each one comes with sort of story so you click on Ecuador it will give you what's happening in Ecuador and then on the right side here it can give you a story about what's going on in Ecuador and what's happening to Venezuela. So we call this basically a story map. So I was able to sit down, you know, for them and create this kind of like online app. Basically, it's called a story map, you know, bringing together the information they had, but otherwise you would have presented this in a very, very boring PowerPoint presentation, just numbers to bring it to the visual here, linking the location, the map with the actual videos from the people who are suffering so you can have a comprehensive understanding of something what's happening for this uh, refugee crisis in uh, South America and uh, use this to raise money for their uh, uh, for their uh, you know effort and that they told me after that you know just this presentation has helped them like triple the amount of money that otherwise would have been able to to raise because it just brought some sort of feeling so it's just a bunch of example of how geoinformatics can help like you know as i said actually it's almost there is unlimited number at this infinite potential of application and areas you can work with and you can really have impact you can impact really benefit the people and i think this is and at the end of the day this is actually ama's mission and uh, amrita university mission is to impact the people support the community and making change and this is the beauty of uh, geoinformatics that allow you to do something like that finally i'm going to actually conclude my presentation with just you know final thoughts and these thoughts are uh, uh, try to conclude this. This is I have like the last slide. It is. Uh, basically like, you know, like, OK, you know, this is a take home message. This is what I, I basically as you are thinking about it. So uh, just keep in mind if you still not sure, should you do your information or not read about it? Remember that actually almost any domain has some sort of geoinformatics. Like, you know, as I told you, like, Computer organization like Apple, Google, IBM, all they have GIS jobs. Cities have GIS jobs. Academia has GIS jobs. Even working in uh, consulting company have GIS jobs. So basically, you know, working with, uh, for example, in the US, working with Forest Service, Natural Conservation, Wildlife, it has GIS jobs. So keep in mind that actually it doesn't matter where we like to work, India 
overseas, what kind of industry, probably you'll find there is a place that has geoinformatics because it's becoming almost everywhere because all these areas you snap in somewhere, you know, from the Indian Space Agency to the delivery station that uh, actually like pizza. So they, they have GIS jobs. The other thing is uh, geoinformatics is not just for geeks. You don't have to be, oh my God, I'm, and I have to know IT technology. There is like always like idea like there is those people who are developing the technology and the software and then there are people who are using the software and learning how to use it in order to solve a problem so it comes with a lot of skills of problem solving you know understanding how to think in a geographic way thinking especially this is like different kind of constructs of thinking like when you start thinking in maps instead of thinking in just numbers of logic so it is yeah yeah there are geeks there but there's also it does not have to be it geek to learn about it Soft skills is important as hard skills. So as I said, problem solving is as important as how to build, a, by how to do Python programming. So the good thing about geoinformatics, it brings you to both. So just to give you just a sample of the project I have been working in right now, I'm working in Latin, in Latin America for a project related to sustainable agriculture. I just finished two proposals, one related to gender-based violence in Brazil, the other one related to uh, small and medium woman owned entrepreneurship businesses in India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. I have been working for two years in women empowerment projects. And before that, I worked actually in disaster modeling in Barbados. And before that, I was working in developing a supply chain platform for a company called the uh, Reinforce Alliance. And before that, I was building a planning support system for the Saudi Arabia government. And before that, I was working in Croatia to build a health information management system. All of these are different ones, health, agriculture, women empowerment, but all this you are crafting information system. I'm not actually changing my career, but just you happen, you, you have to have. So in the process, yes, I'm still building a lot of technology tools, but I'm also having lots of soft skills that use me like problem solving that, you know, and how to apply just rational, ideas like system thinking to solve these problems and that helps a lot when you learn a lot of these when you start coming to geoinformatics and then the last thing actually when you think about it think about the industry like if you are like to explore don't explore what a gis job does what who how much gis technician get paid don't for focus on occupation right now because occupation will come sooner or later focus on the industry and that will allow you better understand how gis can help and how you can actually you know design your own career for JS. Well, thank you so much. I hope this was helpful, give you an idea. I'll be happy to uh, answer a question. Don't forget, actually, if you're interested to go to uh, mtechamrita.edu for the information about the program and how you can apply for that. And I think we have some time for questions, uh, but, you know, Balmakond, or we finished all the time. You, you tell me. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much, you so sir, much. for your enlightening talk. And uh, it was really wonderful, and I hope it covered a uh, lot of questions of the students. Uh, but yeah, we still have some more questions, and you touched upon it. But uh, since it has been asked, maybe you can uh, discuss a little more. Okay. Okay. So I'll go to the question answer. Okay. So Make, make, just make sure that you're loud because I couldn't I, 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 I try to hear you. Yeah. So first question is about GIS maps. Uh, what what is your opinion about GIS maps and uh, the softwares? What's the question? The question is uh, one second. I'm not able to see the question. I cannot hear you, Balma. Uh, I, I'll take that question later. Another question is about uh, from a student uh, who is MTech in uh, environmental engineering and management, uh -huh. and uh, he uh, he is interested in geoinformatics. So, what are the opportunities for him? Well, he's what's his major again? Environmental engineering. 
Well, it depends on the topic, but as you see, basically, like my big question here is the opportunities are numerous. Like basically, that's what this is the message has been trying to convey all the time. So what you are doing in environmental engineering, it depends if you are, for example, studying, uh, um, developing certain kind of like, you know, uh, precision farming, for example, tools, or are you developing technology to support, uh, to monitor the, you know, air pollution, for example, you would like to have a sort of like, you know, understanding of like, you know, data layer to understand what is the pollution there. So if you are, the, I'm not sure basically what you are doing in environmental engineering in terms of the application, but the bottom line here, the question I ask you at the end of the day, do you need some sort of data and this data collected from a place? So yes, probably. So because every kind of data is has locational aspect because it has locational preference, then it is could be mapped and because it could be mapped, it could be part of geoinformatics. For example, there is a lot of uh, like, you know, um, like uh, a lot of application for pollution, for example, tracking pollution, the air pollution and the air plumes. There's also simulation for uh, uh, emission that comes from factories. Uh, you know, for pollution and how you track this and you understand how this impact, for example, neighborhood, like, you know, how this impact even climate change. So yeah, there is a lot of application here. So the bottom line, yes, actually the potential is amazing for environmental engineering in terms of the applications and the maps you can develop that and you can do modeling simulation to understand certain kind of like intervention. So the short answer is yes. The long answer, you have to search it yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Another question is about agriculture and disaster management. So can geoinformatics be used in agriculture and disaster management equipment studies? Yes, um, and I, I'm, a, I'm an example like I was telling you here. So basically in I did my master degree and like I have two master's degree, one in computer science, another one in disaster management. And uh, I have been working in disaster modeling for a long time. Uh, one idea basically like, you know, how we learn from disaster, we wait until disaster happens and then we see what happened. For example, what happened in Kerala two years ago, you wait until the disaster happened and you see the flooding and then you see, okay, how we address this. But another way to be more proactive is don't wait for the disaster to happen. You can simulate the disaster in advance. So there are tools for enable you to simulate the impact of disaster. You can basically decide what will happen even though, thanks God, India is not earthquake country. But what will happen if an earthquake happened in India, for example, you know, tomorrow? Or what will happen if a tsunami happened next, you know, like what happened back in, uh, you know, the big tsunami in Indonesia? And you can simulate the impact of that. And based on the impact, you can actually suggest some sort of measures, maybe have some sort of protection barriers for the shore. Uh, what I did basically in uh, uh, last December, I worked for disaster modeling for hurricane, which is like typhoon in uh, the Caribbean. And uh, we basically try to imitate different uh, levels of disaster intensity and see how many buildings will be impacted. And that actually helped actually the authority right now. They are designing an entire you know, system for uh, early warning and response and evacuation. So it can help in disaster. Agriculture, I'm working right now in agriculture and one of the very interesting application is precision farming and pre precision farming allow you instead of just try if you have big lands or big farms, and instead of uh, trying to apply the same amount of water and chemicals or whatever, even organic farming into the same one that you analyze uh, different land and split it into small mosaic of small pieces and each piece will actually be applied to certain kind of water or certain kind of like treatment based on what it needs. And you can actually build the machinery that automate this. So GIS allow you to do all of this because actually you can put it in tractors and as the tractor move from one place to another, you recognize this from map. Have you ever thought about self-driving cars? Like there is a lot of information about self-driving cars. This is basically geoinformatics because at the end, how the self-driving cars will, will know itself. There is of course, smart technology to allow the car to be sensitive to its neighbor cars and to do the road. But at the end, the underlying needs here is a very solid GIS map that the car is using to know whether it turned right next to the tech turn right or left or move from one place to another. And without this, all the smart cars that we are trying to develop these days are, will not work. So uh, yeah, so basically for agriculture, you can do the same for disaster modeling, you can see the same and that's basically what I've been doing for living these days, so. Thank you very much, sir. I hope this answered the question. Another question is on um, the scope of GIS in glacial monitoring. So can you put some light on that? Glacial modeling in, in India or maybe in Himalayas, right? Glacial, 
monitoring yes sir uh, maybe yeah. in himalaya or in alps yeah i'm thinking because india is too hot for any glacial thing but if you would like to do this yes of course it's almost like landslide the same concept for example think about what the wna is doing in landslide so they are trying to see the movement of the landslide so through a sensors and then the gis help them to to record the displacement and that allow them to understand, you know, what will happen, for example, if this displacement is, is increasing or is going steady to issue a sort of warning to evacuate the people. So and all this happening through integration between sensor development and then and at the end of the day, this is presented in a map. Otherwise, you won't be able to know where it is happening. So you have to have a map and digital map. So the same concept for landslide can be happening, of course, for glacier modeling, uh, monitoring based on. In this case, you are not monitoring the actual landslide. You are monitoring or mudslide. You are monitoring the movement of ice or certain kind of glacial uh, masses. So long answer again, short answer, yes. So, yeah, I told you basically, like, you know, you guys will be probably whatever you can say. If you have asking, can. Can I use GIS for uh, cooking? I would say yes. You know, for somehow I will be able to convince you this. I'm a big fan of GIS, so so the answer will always be yes. Otherwise, you know, unless you tell me, can I use GIS to meditate? Maybe that will be a little bit, you know, question mark. But other than that, GIS can be used for everything else. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, one question from uh, geology background. So. To what extent can the knowledge of programming help a GIS analyst? A lot, a lot, a lot. A lot yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot. And I, the good thing about it, programming is not as hard as it used to be before. For example, uh, you know, Balma Kohn can tell you and other students. Uh, before we had to learn about to do hard coding. Right now, yes, you learn about some sort of coding, but a lot of the programming is happening through virtual programming. For example, in GIS, there is something called GIS modeling tools that allow you to just grab, drop and bot and basically think about the problem and how to solve it and grab the tools. And then after you grab the tools, you can export this into Python programming and that becomes a program that you can use it in different places. So, um, Programming is important and uh, I ended up actually having a master's degree in computer science because, you know, after I, I, I even though I came from a background in construction and engineering, architecture engineering, I figured out in order to progress as a professional GIS and even as academic GIS, I, I needed to learn the programming, I needed to understand software engineering. So I ended up having that and I have been until now using it in, in day to day, um, you know, consulting stuff that I do. But um, so it is important, but what I'm trying to say, it is not as hard as it used to be in the past. In the past used to be lady learn it in the hard way. Right now you understand the logic and a lot of things actually, you know, programming is made very, very easier. So it is important. And I think the part of the geoinformatics program, you learn about Python programming, which is very good and you learn about it. So the good thing about geoinformatics program in Amerita University is that it allows you really to have this integrated thing. You learn about GIS concept, mapping concepts, and then you learn about programming and you learn about technology. So they come together very nicely. So. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Another question uh, is a bit of answered by you, but maybe you can uh, elaborate more. What is your opinion on uh, web GIS and the programming languages to be taken up? Yeah, you see, you see, basically, I show you an example of what I did in the Venezuela example here. So it is basically WebGIS, so it's online using some sort of story map. But interesting enough, I didn't really do any programming. It's all like, you know, with virtual stuff. So basically, it's just plugs and whatever. It's almost like right now, in the past, I used like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, in order to develop a website, you have to learn a lot of HTML. Now you have a lot of apps that allow you to build your website maybe in 10 minutes without even having to know anything about it, like programming, you just basically grab and drop things. And, you know, it's a matter of organizing your website, almost like planning your PowerPoint presentation. So a lot of web GIS stuff right now is happening like that for simple things. Now for big things, for platform that need to be op operational, whatever, you need a little bit extra things and learn about programming, learn about tool, understanding more kind of like how to develop like, you know, um, solid uh, view databases and that work online and cloud computing. But other than that, for simple application, like the one that I did in Venezuela, I was showing you with videos and with all these things. I built this basically in a few hours. So uh, it was not really uh, rocket science because I didn't do any actual programming. We just grab and drop and there is a lot of tools that enable you to do that. Open source and also non open source. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I hope we covered uh, most of the questions and other questions are related. So I think you answered them. So 
okay. by this i will come to the conclusion uh, thank you all for joining thank you for your patience and i hope uh, you enjoyed it i hope it uh, it gave you a lot of uh, knowledge in the field of geoinformatics uh, sir can you also briefly mention about some of the online resources that uh, students can access for uh, getting more knowledge about uh, geoinformatics and uh, gis yeah, uh, I think we can share with them after the course. If for those people interested, you can share some resources. What I discovered actually, of course, there is uh, gogisday.com. It will give you a lot of resources about GIS Day, about GIS careers. Uh, Google GIS careers. You know, if you are interested, like, you know, I think a lot of the people, it depends on like, when you come to do a master degree because the master degree will, you know, shape to a certain extent what kind of like next step in your career so i'd like to see so just go gis jobs or gis career and just see how how many jobs are there and the variety of jobs i've observed like it varies from programmers to analysts to director to managers to data collector it's just all over the places you know and not in india only but also in other places uh, go to the gis certification like just so you know how to get certified as gis professional so try to use this keyword like you know i wouldn't recommend a specific site there are a specific site but just try gis day that will give you lots of resources about what gis is what example what gis people do and some materials search uh, I, I got my some of these videos from the gis day website google gis jobs and see how many jobs are there and you know just get an idea about how salaries are and uh, also google uh, something like uh, you know like you know basically like uh, you know uh, career resources or some again like, you know, just just put some combination between jobs career gis and then see what will bring the internet there's a lot of information there if you are interested in specific information you know i uh, i can try to recommend you some of the information for sure, sure like you know but uh, like for example the website with the india website here i found there's something called gis world JS World is Indian website that actually has lots of information about the world, but also it is because it's it's a magazine actually called JS World that's issued in India, and it has this one. So they have this forum that basically how JS now they are trying to promote some sort of JS with the government. So you'll find a lot of resources there also, especially for India. So thank you so much, sir. So thank you all for joining, and do follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And we are conducting uh, webinars regularly, so you will get details on that.